Hi, everybody. Welcome to APL Reader's Corner. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Tessie, and we're here with Nicole. Um, so for we've decided to switch things up with Reader's Corner. So now we're doing it monthly, um, which we uh, mentioned at our last Reader's Corner last month. Um, but for September's um, Reader's Corner, we were reading Moon of the Crusted Snow by Wabushik Rice. I mispronounced his name, I think. Um, Wabishik Rice. Yeah, um, so this was a really interesting book, but if this is the first time you've joined us for Reader's Corner, um, basically for Reader's Corner, we have a book discussion about the book that we are reading month um, for the month. Right? All books that we are reading are available on Hoopla, so if you're listening to the Reader's Corner and you think the book sounds interesting, you can go and check out that book right away. Um, and now for Reader's Corner, we have a new element that if you guys want to join us in the discussion before we have our recording or our live, you can um, check out our Facebook. We have a Facebook post every month with some questions. And so you can read the book along with us during the month and answer the questions. Let us know what you think about the book. Um, and we'll talk about it during our Reader's Corner. Uh, so thank you guys for all joining us today. Um, and for this month, basically every month we pick a, a book from a different genre. So this month we did dystopian. So that's where we got this book from. It seemed kind of fitting for 2020. Yeah. Um, so I was really excited to do dystopian because um, this is a genre I enjoy very much. I know Tessie does too. Uh, the definition is a world in which everything is imperfect and everything goes terribly wrong. Dystopian literature shows us a nightmarish image about what might happen to the world in the near future. Some of the more popular um, books in this uh, genre would be like The Hunger Games, 1984, uh, The Giver, and so on. So it's definitely a very popular genre. Um, some common themes uh, of dystopian is that uh, there's rebellion, oppression, revolutions, wars, overpopulation, even disasters. One of the characteristics is that generally there is no government, or if there is, it's oppressive and it's a controlling government. Um, either there is a huge income gap between the poor and the rich, or everyone faces extreme poverty. Um, the propaganda that's put forth by the government or the ruling class takes control of human minds. Um, and then something I thought was interesting was the function of dystopia. So dystopian authors really want to express their concerns about the issues of humanity and society, and they want to warn people about their own weaknesses. Um, their technique is to discuss reality and depict issues that could actually happen in the future. Um, the role is to both educate and give awareness. Um, and it serves as a warning about the current state of affairs of either a government or even those in power. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't think that we've been taking those warnings from all the dystopian books that have been written. Definitely um, not. No, we weren't prepared for this year. Um, but yeah, so while with that genre, which is a very wide reaching genre, um, we picked a book and I wanted to read this book in particular because it's from an indigenous author. Um, so the author, uh, Wabashig Rice, um, is from one of the First Nations. Like, I, I should have looked up the pronunciation for that particular one. Um, but it's, I feel like a good, uh, a large part of Reader's Corner is to try and, the reason we pick all these different genres is to try and see literature and see different perspectives from different authors so it was i think it was really cool that we picked a dystopian with an indigenous indigenous author so we could kind of see what his perspective of what a dystopian would look like um which we'll we, we'll get into in a little bit um but the book we did end up picking was moon of the crested snow um and the summary for that particular book i'm just going to read it um is with winter looming a small northern Ashinabe Osh con community goes dark Panic builds as the food supply dwindles. While the band council and a pocket of community members struggle to maintain order, an unexpected visitor arrives, escaping the crumbling society to the south. Soon after, others follow. Tensions rise, and as the months, months pass, so does the death toll due to sickness and despair. 
Frustrated by the building chaos, a group of young friends and their families turned to the land and the Ashinabe tradition in hopes of helping their community thrive again. Blending action and allegory, Moon of the Crested Snow upends our expectations. Out of catastrophe comes resilience, and as one society collapses, another is reborn. Uh, so I thought that was a really interesting take on dystopian, where it's like, it's not just all about how things fall apart and how humanity is not dealing with it well, because I feel like that's a pretty big theme. Like if you read Hunger Games, like in no way, shape or form, are you looking at that society and being like, well, they're dealing with uh, the dystopian future pretty well. So um, the author of Rice, um, a little bit of his background is that he started in journalism. Um, he was an exchange student in Germany where he was writing a lot of articles about his exper experiences as an Ashinabe teen. Um, which uh, the Ashinabe are sort of, it's a group of culturally related um, indigenous peoples who live in sort of Canada and Northern US. Um, but he graduated from Ryerson University um, in the journalism program in 2002. And so he's reported a lot in um, CBC News and a lot of different media. He's written a lot of short stories. Um, a lot of his writing is kind of centered around his um, background. So a lot about uh, indigenous peoples, a lot about the Ashinabe. So he's putting that in literature. Um, you can see that in this book a lot too, is where he's, um, when he's writing about his community, like he puts in parts like maybe like you wouldn't know about if you're not familiar with um, that particular, um, like first nation tribes up there. Um, so Moon of the Crested Snow uh, was first published in 2018. So this is relatively recent. So just right before <laughs> um, our own dystopian, sort of dystopian. Um, but it was a national bestseller. Um, so this month we picked a bestseller. So that's pretty interesting. Sometimes we pick books that hardly anybody hears about. Uh, but yeah, and so it's a pretty interesting book. All right, um, there were a couple reviews for this book. Uh, Amazon, there was a 4.5 out of 5. Goodreads had a 3.92 out of 5, which they have a lot of those. I don't think they ever get to a 4. They get or right above a 4. Um, Hoopla had no rating. So if you end up reading this book and you like it, I think you should give a rating on Hoopla just so we can bump up those, uh, <laughs> bump up those ratings there. I, I should rate the book. I'll probably rate it. Five? I think it deserves a five. I would rate it a five. Although I'm pretty, I'm not very strict about my ratings. That's true. Um, so I guess uh, we can jump into some of our discussion questions. Uh, Tessie, what did you think of the overall book? You already said you gave a five review rating, but maybe why did you like it so much? Um, so when I do my ratings, like I usually don't rate a book if I'm like indifferent to it, but this one I felt like it deserves to be rated. And so usually when I rate it, I'll do like four or five. Like I feel like this was a very good dystopian book. Like I started reading this book and I just felt chills going up and down my spine. And it's like the author was very good about like creating that sense of dread when things start slowly falling apart. Um, I feel in the second half of the book, like you kind of lose that feeling of dread because like you already, like they've already gotten to the point where it's like, oh, like um, society is crumbling down south. Like now we're just struggling to survive. So you lose the dread a little bit, but it starts getting taken up by, oh, how do we survive this and some other things. But that first half of the book with like, when like they're trying to figure out like, oh, like why is the power not on? Like, I thought it was interesting that their internet and their um, power cut off and they're like, oh, we're kind of used to this. Um, let's wait a couple days and we'll see if it comes back on. And they didn't really realize at the beginning that it was actually like a national or a global whatever kind of crisis that they're like, oh, we can survive a couple weeks without power. And I'm like, can you? So I really like that part. Good. Yeah. No, I liked it too. It was... Um... It was a little hard, though, because it gave us some flashbacks to uh, what we're kind of dealing with now. We'll probably get into that later, but there were definitely some points where once you figured out it wasn't just happening to their area, um, that's when 
you know, stuff became real and it became a little bit more urgent and scary considering they didn't know if and when help would ever arrive for them. So yeah, like you said, there was that building tension of dread wondering what was happening and then the steady de decline of the um, of that area and of the people and then certain people you could see the definite um, groups of those who were prepared and ready to deal with this type of event and those who just were not clearly ready or even aware of their situation. So um, makes you wonder where you would fit in into those groups. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to think I was the prepared ones, but I don't think so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, do you think it fits some of those genre themes that we talked about? Just the idea of that, um, and in, you know, uh, it's not a perfect world, things are gonna go wrong, uh, something that can happen will happen, or even just the idea of those in power, um, either struggling to stay in power or oppressing those who are, do not have power. I feel like the take on this book was really interesting because like here is this community and they have their own like government, like they have their band council, um, they have their elders that give them advice, like they have a way that it's organized and it's organized in a way that it's self-sufficient. So their power structure does not rely on um so much so much canada's power structure i think they were in canada or the us's power structure like they did their thing and like during regular times like they would get input like i really thought it was interesting that they had a boardroom that they used a little bit later and they're like oh this is the room where we're meeting like outside people if we need something like um like we're discussing like I don't know what they were discussing, but things like when outside people would come in, they would discuss it, then they would leave. So they were very self-sufficient in that way. And I thought it was really interesting that um, the only failings I think in their power structure was more that they had a leader, Terry, I think his name was, that while he was fine as their chief during normal peace times, during a crisis, he was like falling apart. Like he just could not handle it. And other people picked up that slack um, I think the really interesting thing that kind of makes it, other than like the crisis situation, that makes it a dystopian is um, Scott, which I think we'll talk about a little bit later some more. Um, mm -hmm. But Scott is basically uh, a guy from down south during the crisis. He's like probably a prepper survivalist kind of person. He like comes into town like a week after the crisis or two weeks, a couple weeks, um, all prepped with his snowmobile and all his ammo and his guns, basically, and all his stuff. And he's like, can I live with you guys? And they're like, um, I guess. <laughs> Which, and it's like trying to see him vie for power in their community was really interesting. Um, and I think the author was trying to like, um, he said in an interview that it was like his, like it was like a allegory or a metaphor for colonialism where you have this big white dude come into this um, uh, indigenous people's first nation and try and power play so it's kind of like that dynamic was really interesting yeah um, okay so let's get into some questions so in dystopian scenarios there's a loss of individualism uh, that can be a reoccurring theme how important is it for people to have a choice and how do you think this loss of individualism portrayed in this book? Uh, like, I feel like a lot of other dystopians like highlight this a lot more where in this particular book, just because they were so community orientated that it wasn't so big of a shift for them to be like, oh, like, I need to go and hunt some things and I'm going to give a portion. Like at the beginning of the book, it was already the main character, Evan, he was hunting and he would always give part of it to his friends, his family. And it was just that sense of community right from the norm, like from the beginning in their normal life. So it's like that transition to a crisis situation. I didn't see as much selfishness out of their community as or the selfishness that stems from individualism. So. 
Well, I saw a difference though, as time went on where you did, like you're right, there was that sense of community and communal gathering, communal food and stuff. But then I almost think that as time wore on and some of those people who weren't as prepared were panicking and freaking out, they became less about the community and clearly more about themselves, but it was only certain groups of people like Evan and the tribe elders and um, the chief or the council, they were very much into still the sense of community where there were other people that were definitely in it for themselves. I mean, there was even the story that the grandpa told about the geese and the moral of the story is to not be greedy. Um, so I saw that definitely a lot. <laughs> that was a big thing. Yeah. So with dystopians, like dystopians generally like to show humanity's response to a crisis. And usually we handle it pretty badly. Um, how do you think the author portrayed this in the novel? Like, do you agree with his point of view? Um, there's one particular area of the book that I thought was really interesting. Um, where one of the community elders, um, uh, she has an important conversation with the main character. And she basically, um, like Evan is talking to her about, oh, or I think she brings it up and she's like, oh, all these young kids are talking about the end of the world. Um, she's like, doesn't she know that our people have experienced this so-called apocalypse um, over and over again? Like we experienced it, um, like when they kicked us from our original, um, homeland like we experienced it when they took our children from us um to like basically um oh, i forgot the word for it but it's like indo like indoctrinate i want to say like they put the um, um indigenous people's children's into school to like be like oh christianity english like you have to learn all these things and not your um your own culture so she was basically saying oh we do this over and over again like and we've survived so what is your take on that um, well, the first question is, obviously, we kind of said it already, where it seemed like in this book, it was very different than a lot of other dystopians was because even though there was a crisis, they still stuck together. And it affected them, but it didn't affect them maybe as much as probably some of the other cities that were nearby, because they relied heavily in technology and electricity and everything where this um, Ashinabi people they relied on the land. They kept with their traditions and their customs from generations before. So they were a lot more prepared to deal with um, this type of crisis than probably our society would. Um, so that was definitely interesting how he portrayed that. And um, I think I agree with him that there might be like I said, there's groups where there are groups that will survive and that will endure the hardest events and there were some that just might not be able to handle it and the community's elder she was she was really sweet she was trying to understand what the word apocalypse meant but she knew what the word apocalypse meant um like you said they have dealt with it before so when you could see her demeanor she was not worried she knew that in the end her people would survive um, because they have, they've endured this time and time again from being forced out of their own land into another land that they had to make their own and again and again and again. So she just sees this as another generation. You know, she sees this as another time in passing where, you know, okay, we're going to deal with this again and we're going to come back better and stronger than we were before and so on. And the, it's a cycle for her. She sees it as nothing more than just a cycle where some of the younger people on this reserve just did, couldn't fathom or understand or even comprehend what was going on in their situation. And I think they were also trying to get away from their traditional customs, which shows them that sometimes the old way is the better way. So, <laughs> at least that's how I took it. <laughs> yeah, definitely more survivable, like a better survival strategy, that's for sure. Oh, um, yeah. 
Um, so in this, the community was forced to make a number of tough choices as supplies were dwindling and the power continued to stay off. So how well do you think they managed this crisis and do you think there, there could have been things that they could have done differently or are there things you would have done differently if you were put in this situation? Um, if I was put in a situation where there was an apocalypse, I don't think I would survive. But if I was in that particular location, um, I feel like the ability to survive would go up a lot more just because they were so prepared. Like they already had systems in place if they didn't get electricity, how to heat their homes, like which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, but I feel like they, not to like judge a situation that is fictional and also like not, I wouldn't, it's like the hindsight kind of thing. It's like, oh, if I had done this, if I had done that, it would have turned out better. Like in hindsight, if they had told Scott to just go out into the wilderness, like don't mess with us, I feel like their community would have um, stayed a little bit more close knit. Cause like, like you were mentioning before, like people did start breaking off into groups. Like they did have some people who didn't know how to hunt as well and um, survive off the land as well, gravitate towards Scott and his promises when he was like, oh, um, like he was a power structure or a power um, figure in that community um, and he took advantage of them. And so it's like at the beginning, if he had, they had been like, get lost, but it's like in hindsight, you can say that, but at the very beginning when you have this person standing in front of you and there's a crisis situation, do you really want to be that person who's like, you guys should leave? Um, or like, no, you're not allowed into here. Like you want to have that generosity of spirit, even though later it ends up biting them. So I don't know. It was one of those situations where you're like, no, don't do that. But then they did it. But it's really like, you can't really act any other way. Well, and just the build of Scott himself, do you really think, even if they would have told him to leave, do you think he would have? No, and then it's like, I was thinking <laughs> myself, it's like, what if they told him to leave, right? So he would have gone off into the wilderness, recruited a bunch of other people, and then probably yes. come back in like with his arsenal and his snowmobile and come back and try and like cause trouble. Yeah. Like, eventually they would have like had trouble finding food and then seeing this community that had an emergency stockpile like they would have been like that emergency stockpile belongs to us so it could have made the situation worse so i, I definitely see that let's see so we do have this question here i don't know how much we want to delve into it but um the author uh did refer to evan so our main character that we see most of the book through um as an anti-hero so what do you think about that like why would he say he's sort of like an anti-hero well it's not like he was the one leading everything and rallying all the troops together he was still following the council's orders while at the same time also following his own um, beliefs. So, and also you could see him actually lose trust in the council. Um, and as a hero, they are the ones who are always to uphold the law and always uphold the order of things. And he saw very quickly how um, how quickly the council was losing that order and losing that power, so to speak. So, but he didn't take it upon himself then to become the leader himself. So I think that's probably why Rice referred to him as an anti-hero, but he wasn't a, like, but he never called him a villain either. He's just a real life character in a real life event that could happen. So you're going to have those people that while they're still going to follow the order and everything, if it, if it disseminates or whatever, they're not going to step up mm -hmm. because he has his own family that he needs to protect because of everything going around them. So that's what I think he means as anti-hero. Mm -hmm. I agree with you a hundred percent. That's what I was thinking too. <laughs> um, so I'm going to skip a couple questions because I really want to get to that. Uh, we were talking about Justin Scott, the white man that came to the reserve. Mm 
Um, and like you said, according to the author, he's more of an allegory for colonialism. Um, there's a quote where a hardened survivalist, he presumes he can come into the community and be welcomed and take what he needs. These are all traits in direct opposition to the virtues of the Ashinabi life that the community members are trying to uphold, mm -hmm. according to the author. Mm -hmm. What do you think made him so frightening to this story? Yeah, and it's like, I wanna say at the beginning of the story, like when he first comes in, like I was general, like I was genuinely viewing him as a villain. Like he would come into a scene and I was just like, oh, this guy. Um, a little bit later, um, when he ends up pushing some of the, like a little bit of a spoiler, like pause if you don't want to hear it, um, or mute, but a little bit of a spoiler is that he ends up pushing some of the community members into cannibalism, um, which is like once he resorted to that, like the author put that in there because he was um, like, he says that he was trying to um, put in some of the, some folklore from the Ashinabe people about the Wendigo. So that's why Evan has that dream that Scott looks like a werewolf sort of creature, like creature coming to eat people. Um, but it was like, when it got to that point, he didn't seem as scary because he seemed more controllable. Like, oh, you finally crossed the line where you've done something so bad we can like get rid of you, which they did. Um, but before that, it was like, there was this back and forth between, it's like, we really don't like, Evan especially, he was like, I really don't like this guy. I really don't trust this guy. Like, what is he going to do, right? And it's like, you could tell that he was up to no good um, because he tried putting himself in where he was not welcome and you could tell from the very beginning that he was not respectful of their community and their ways so you just knew that he was going to do something so i think that's what made him so frightening is the fact that he was not respectful of their community and um in a crisis situation where you have that unknown it's i feel like it's really hard to deal with yeah i think so too but i it was weird because in the beginning, I saw him as somewhat respecting their people because he tried to use some of the language and he was also trying to be, but I, it made me wonder if that was just a facade of him just trying to weasel his way into the reserve. Um, and then, yeah, the whole time though, I was just like, I don't trust this man, but I wonder if, if what also could have made him um, so fearful was that fear of retaliation, retaliation, fear of telling him no and what he could do. Yeah. So I think that was definitely a big, big one as well. It's not just he looked frightening and what he did was frightening, but what he could do was also frightening. Yeah. Well, I agree with you. He was just a very effective villain. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Um, so I thought this question was pretty interesting. So how was your perception of land-based knowledge? How has it changed from before reading the novel and after reading the novel? Um, so yeah, so that's basically the question. I won't go into part two because it's basically the same. Um, well, I'm not. Um, Let's see. That's a good question. Um, I guess I didn't think about that type of land-based knowledge before I started reading this book. Um, but then once you learn a little bit more about the reserve and the people that we were reading about, um, I understood it a little more. I um, really liked his um, editions of the actual culture and the um, the the traditions they used, especially when they would go hunting um, and how they still gave uh, respect to the land and respect to the, um, the spirits, the God spirits, I think they're spirits. Um, so that was really interesting. I, I didn't know anything about that beforehand. Um, I don't know as much even after this, but it was really, really cool to see his, his own um, culture take place in this type of book. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I agree with that. Like, I also didn't know much before. I still don't know that much after, but there were, he, the author definitely put in um, a lot from his 
own background and the Ashinabe like traditions and how they live their life into this book. So I felt like I learned a lot. Well, and knowing that he has a wife and two kids, it makes me feel like the dynamic between Ethan, Nicole, and his kids were probably um, very much inspired by his own real life. And probably because he also names his kids um, uh, Anishinaabe type names, um, just like Evan does his own kids because he wants them to upheld their culture and traditions from previous. So um, that made me think that he probably in like modeled that family after his own. So maybe he thinks himself the anti-hero. Who knows? <laughs> Um, so right at the end of this book, spoiler alert, uh, Scott is done away with mm -hmm. and we're, we enter spring and there's still no word of power, technology, or the outside world around them. So how did you feel about the ending of this book? Was there anything that surprised you over the last couple of chapters? And how do you think the future will play out for this community? So I wasn't surprised by the ending. I kind of saw it coming. Like I, there was one really interesting element of the book where um, I want to say Evan and Nicole, I don't know if some of the other community members mentioned, but they were having dreams. So they were having dreams like Nicole had a dream near the beginning um, where her, she was struggling through the snow, right? And every time she would fall, her children would pick her back up, right? And then it ends with um, her children picking her back up and now they're older. So they're like young adults and they lead her into like sort of a winter camp. Um, and they're like, oh, mom, it's gonna be okay. So she spends all this time stressing about, oh, there's no power, like how are we gonna survive? Um, and they're surviving pretty, like they're surviving, they're doing well as far as circumstances go. Um, and she has this dream where her kids say, we're going to be just fine. And I felt like that was just like a mirror of what their ending was going to be. So I was like, I'm not surprised. Like I saw this coming, like the steps to getting there are going to be difficult. Um, but I was like, I, I like that ending. Like it was an ending of re resiliency um, for a dystopian book. So it was pretty hopeful, I want to say. Well, and also just showing that, um, the Anishinaabe people will prevail. Yeah. They'll continue to thrive no matter where they are, no matter what circumstance they're in. And I think it was also for his people to just remind them of their resiliency and just their pride for their, their own people. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I definitely liked it. Um, I have to ask this question because I was having flashbacks while I'm reading this to 2020 back in March in the grocery stores. There was a scene where it's the beginning of um, them finding out there is no power. They're not going to be getting shipments. They're not going to be getting any help from the outside world. And Evan goes to the grocery store and it's slim pickings. And all it did was just remind me back in March when we went to the grocery store for the first time after everything, after the shutdown and the shelves were empty. <laughs> and I was feeling the dread and the fear of this isn't something that's, you know, outside the realm of possibility. Um, so were there any moments in this book where you're just like, oh, real life, ooh. <laughs> no, that definitely was a point it's like uh it was just like the whole first book where they're going through this it's just like i kept reading it and being like oh like they're dealing with it like pretty well and then i'm like we're not we wouldn't deal with it that well like when the so at the very beginning i want to say a week after the shutdown or like not shut down a week after their crisis where the power goes out um two kids that had been going to school in a town down south um, snowmobile their way back up to the town and then come back right and they have this horror story of how everything in the south like like it's just crumbling to pieces the cities the towns are just crumbling to pieces like their university was like in shambles like kids were dying and I was like and they were like talking about how they had to like like sneakily gather supplies and like the 
by some sort of luck, they found some snowmobiles in their uh, mechanic shop that everybody had forgotten about, um, and them having to um, deal with what were probably some robbers, but at that point it was like so desperate of a situation where they were like in fear for their life, and so they had to fight against these people so they could escape. Um, and so it was just like, like that dread of where in 2020, like it started with those, those shelves going empty and then it's like, oh, could it like, not that it did descend into that kind of madness in the book, but it's just like, oh, we had that first step in real life. Like, could we have these other steps in real life too? So it was just like, oh. It was kind of scary. <laughs> it wasn't that far off from present day, and it was a little, <laughs> um, But yeah, the author did a very good job in making you feel that, and now that it's like, I feel like almost everybody has that context now, it made it worse. Yeah. I was like, why am I reading a dystopian right now? But, um, so we have one kind of last question, which is the, penultimate question maybe for some readers I think for the author it wasn't important why the world was ending but why do you think like what do you think happened like power shut off everything like no internet no satellite like what happened well as what it sounded like in the south uh they went insane there was pure chaos uh probably everywhere outside the um, Anishinaabe uh, community. Um, I think eventually I would like to be hopeful in humanity and that the rest of the world persisted and figured a way to survive themselves. Um, but I think, I think the idea is that you just want to have hope in your community and your people that they they continue to thrive at thrive at the same uh rate as the anishinaabe community although i have a feeling they probably prevailed a lot more just because they have dealt with uh similar circumstances before mm -hmm. yeah i wonder if it was like a solar flare or something like that that just knocked out the power yeah Pretty interesting what-if scenario. I feel like some communities would deal with it better, especially like the um, Anishinaabe, um, probably the rural areas would be a lot better than mm -hmm. the dense packings of cities and towns, so. You would see the, um, the dependence on certain people change. So it would be like, less on the government and more on like the farmers and stuff kind of like what we saw uh present day where we relied heavily on our first responders and our essential workers so i think there was probably be a shift just like we see right now yeah hope for the best but prepare for the worst yeah <laughs> <laughs> but overall i thought it was a good book and i really enjoyed it mm -hmm. definitely re recommend reading it it was a very good it was a different take to a dystopian that I really enjoyed. Definitely. Yep. Cool. Well, thank you guys for all joining us for Reader's Corner. Um, next month, we're going to be um, reading for October, Gideon the Ninth. So it's a sci-fi fantasy book. I'm really excited about that one. Um, it has a lot of LGBTQ elements in there. So I'm like, oh, cool. Um, and um, I've forgotten the author off the top of my head, but we will be posting discussion questions on Facebook. So if you guys want to read along and join us and tell us what you think about the book, definitely do that. And um, we'll be doing these monthly from now on. Don't forget to check out story times uh, every day at 10 a.m. And next Friday, our brand new program again, APL Made in a Mug at 1 p.m. So Nicole did the last one and the cake looked delicious. I it was so good. It looks so good. So, so good. definitely check those out. We're doing a lot of virtual programming stuff, so um, it's a lot of fun if you just take a look at our Facebook page. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.